You have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You turn us back to dust and say, turn back, you mortals, for a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it is past, or like a watch in the night. You sweep them away, they are like a dream, like grass that is renewed in the morning. In the morning it flourishes and is renewed. In the evening it fades and withers. Turn, O Lord, how long? Have compassion on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love, so that we may replace and be glad all our days. Come, let us worship God.
Let us pray. Gracious God, source of all goodness and beauty, giver of every good and perfect gift, we thank you for being present to us. We know that we are never alone. You are faithful to your people and rich in mercy. Bless us with your presence today. Pour out your spirit upon us that we might have the same mind that was in Christ Jesus. And then equip us to do your holy work in our lives. Amen. The peace and joy of the Lord be with you on this Lord's Day. Welcome to worship on this Reformation Sunday as we remember and give thanks for the reformers of the 16th century, draw inspiration from their witness, and acknowledge that the Holy Spirit is still engaged in the formation and reformation of God's people. Today's music is inspired by the Reformation. We had our opening hymn attributed to John Calvin. Keith Glennon is sporting his kilt as we Presbyterians have our roots in the Church of Scotland. And Dorothy will introduce a very special guest during the children's message a little bit later in the service. Thank you for joining us today. A copy of the Order of Worship may be found on our website, catonsvillepress.org, or on our Facebook page. This morning, we also welcome our guest soloist, Marianne Schick, who is a member of First and Franklin Presbyterian Church in downtown Baltimore. Thankfully, Greg can uh, finally take a week and off. So, uh, Marianne, it's great to have you with us today. The uh, prayer list, our intercessory prayer list, will be going out again on Wednesday. Please send your prayer requests to Dorothy Bolton. You can either send her an email or post something on our, uh, on our church's Facebook uh, page. Our participation in the Crop Hunger Walk continues through, uh, through all of October, so there's still time to support either a, a walker or just give to this, to this ministry. Also, next Sunday will be All Saints Sunday. This is the day in which we remember those who have gone on before us and are part of the saints in light. If you have a loved one that you would like us to remember, uh, we will be invoking the names of loved ones of, that we've lost this past year. If you would like us to remember a loved one in the service as we gather around the Lord's table, please be sure to send in that name um, to Shirley in the church office uh, by Monday morning so that we can gather the, uh, the list and put the liturgy uh, together. And this coming week on Thursday evening, we will have our next adult education offering, uh, God and the Pandemic. We will be viewing an interview with N.T. Wright, the biblical scholar, as he reflects biblically and theologically on how we kind of think and, and approach or might think and approach uh, this experience of a global plan pandemic and what this means for our lives in the living of these days. The Zoom link to this uh, gathering, to this class, will go out on Thursday morning. This is also the season of giving and thanksgiving as we begin our, our stewardship campaign for the, for the year. Stewardship, of course, is year-round, uh, but our special focus on stewardship begins this week. And we are grateful that Brad Piercy, the chair of our stewardship committee, and Megan Piercy are today together offering our moment for stewardship. So, Brad and Megan, thank you. Hi, CPC. I'm Brad Piercy. And I'm Megan Piercy. And I'm chairing stewardship this season and wanted to introduce our theme in worship, virtually speaking, of course. Ken kicked off our focus on stewardship in The Messenger this week. And our stewardship theme is 2 Corinthians 9.15, which says, Thanks be to God for God's indescribable gift. In this current time, when so much feels disrupted, we think it is important to take stock in what we have to be grateful for. So Megan and I wanted to share a few words. So in last week's Prayers of the People, one of the things that uh, Dorothy said is, Make of us a grateful, joy-filled people, a light to which others are drawn. And I, that really spoke to me um, and made me think about some of the different ways that um, I'm appreciative of what the church is doing even um, during our current situation. Um, a couple of those include finding ways to bring us together. Um, and I know Ken and Dorothy have both talked about us being scattered yet together. 
I'm really appreciative of our worship services continuing uh, remotely and all the hard work that Keith and, and Kathy are doing to make those look so nice um, each week. Um, I've really appreciated the services where we've had the singing of the choir coming together and I'm sure all the work that the choir members and Greg are doing to make that sound so outstanding as well as the work that some of our different musicians in the church have, have uh, shared their music with us. That's been wonderful to get to um, see as well. And another aspect that I've been really appreciative of that our church continues to do is our continued mission work, including um, the non-perishable food drive. I know the work of the Envision Board continues forward uh, right now. And uh, for instance, just right now, the Crop Walk as well. So yeah, and I'm I'm grateful for uh, you know how CBC has tried to balance the seriousness of of this whole pandemic with the need to be church, even if that might look a bit different viewing worship through our screens, um, but hopefully feeling the church presence in our homes. Uh, I personally benefited from uh, the dismantling racism book club and discussion uh, that we had last month, uh, continuing to chip away at the system that is that is racism. Um, We've appreciated the continuing outreach to our to our youth, our kids, and with all the ongoing work the the church has uh, going on, more than more than building the building itself, uh, which we currently aren't meeting in, um, but the church it needs the stewardship now as much as ever, and so um, I know we give to the ch to the church because we feel it's our responsibility and and it's our pleasure um, as. And like to say, God loves a hilarious giver. So to support the mission of this church, um, be it through the, the programs um, that are ongoing, the, the mission work, um, and, and the pastoral teaching, the, the care, the outreach, and the leadership within the church, but also in the, in the wider community. Um, so we just wanted to, to reach out to the church and to kick off this stewardship, stewardship season and um, welcome you. Uh, to uh, consider the giving as, as we go forward in this time. Thanks so much. I am happy to introduce our special guest this morning. This is Martin Luther. You may remember him because we've had him around for a couple years, but the truth is that he was around a long, long time ago. You may be able to tell from his clothes or his outfit, but Martin Luther lived about 500 years ago. He's very important to us because when he was a monk living in Germany long ago, he had some questions. He had questions about God and about the church. So what he did to find his answers is he went to scripture. He read the Bible. And he thought and he prayed and made some decisions and had lots of conversations. Anyhow, a lot happened in the Reformation. But among the many, many, many changes that happened because of Martin Luther is in our Bible. You see, when Martin Luther read the Bible, it was in a language called Latin. And most people could not read Latin. And Martin Luther said, you know what? I had a lot of questions and read the Bible. I think everyone should be able to do that too. So he translated the Bible into German. Now, maybe you, but I certainly, most of the time, read the Bible in English. And when we give our Bibles to our third graders, to our families, the one in our pews, they are in English. Because for many of us, that's our first language, and we are able to read the Bible in English course it's been translated into all kinds of languages and you can read it in the language you choose but what's important is that we are able to read the Bible and think for ourselves and pray for ourselves and have a conversation with God and with one another about what we've read and what we are led to understand by the Holy Spirit so today again among many things we thank Martin Luther for that gift, and we thank all the people in faith that have come before us and helped us to understand and question and know God just a little bit deeper and a little bit better. So for all of you, thank you, thank you, thank you.
Let us say, Amen. Welcome, Martin. <laughs> Our next hymn is actually uh, a hymn that we don't sing very often, Out of the Depths. It's, it's a setting of Psalm 130. The text is actually written, or paraphrased, by, written by Martin Luther in 1524. And the music, the melody, the tune of this hymn was also written by Martin Luther. Let us pray. Startle us, O God, with your truth, and open our hearts and our minds to your wondrous love. Speak your word to us, 
silence in us any voice but your own. And be with us now as we turn our full attention, our minds and our hearts to you. In Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. Our scripture for this morning is from Paul's letter to the church in Thessalonica, from 1 Thessalonians, second chapter, the lectionary for this day, verses 1 through 8. So let us listen now for what the Spirit says to the church. You yourselves know, brothers and sisters, that our coming to you was not in vain. But though we had already suffered and been shamefully mistreated at Philippi, as you know, we had courage in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in spite of great opposition. For our appeal does not spring from deceit or impure motives or trickery, but just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the message of the gospel, even so we speak not to please mortals, but to please God who tests our hearts. As you know, and as God is our witness, we never came with words of flattery, or with a pretext for greed. Nor did we seek praise from mortals, whether from you or from others, though we might have made demands as apostles of Christ. But we were gentle. We, will, we were gentle among you, like a nurse tenderly caring for her own children. So deeply do we care for you that we are determined to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves, because you, because you have become very dear to us. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The 16th century reform of the church in Europe was a reformation of thought, a reformation of ideas. The reform was driven by the need to read and translate the Bible with new eyes, with fresh eyes, to yield new ideas, ideas that were new for the reformers for many, but very old, actually, neglected and forgotten parts of the faith. Martin Luther said he rediscovered the gospel through his encounter with the book of Romans, reading it in the original Greek. The push for reform of the church was inspired by rigorous theological engagement of questions pertaining to the authority of Scripture, as Dorothy alluded to. Who has the authority to read and interpret Scripture? This enormously generative time yielded profound theological reflections on the person and work of Jesus Christ, the nature of grace, the role of faith, the relationship between faith and works, the nature and purpose of the church, a mind-numbing debate over what happens when Christians gather here at the Lord's table, breaking bread and sharing a cup in remembrance of Him. And there were discussions about the nature and the purpose of the state, of the church's relationship with the magistrate, the work of the church in the world, the nature of the Christian life. And most essentially, especially for Calvin, the, our understanding of vocation. As Reformed Protestants, vocation is central. For to be baptized is to be called. And everyone who is baptized is therefore called to use all of one's resources all of one's gifts and experience and faculties and abilities, all for the glory of God. So yes, it was a heady affair, the Reformation. 
It was a war of beliefs within the church, a war of ideas. And when the Protestants left the Roman Catholic Church, or some were actually kicked out of the Roman Catholic Church, the Protestants continued to fight over ideas and divide over ideas and beliefs with heated debate over things today we would consider to be minutia or irrelevant. To view the Reformation as essentially a war of ideas, however, as an intellectual affair, is to miss the impact that the, that the rediscovery of the gospel had upon culture and social structures, of the role of women in society, for example, the reforming of liturgy and music, architecture, the arts, education, finance, impacting the ordinary lives of women and men and children in the 16th century right down through to today. So yes, the Reformation was a revolution of ideas, but these ideas emerged from within the experience of human life and human suffering, of human beings searching for meaning and purpose in the face of war and disease and hunger and poverty, people obsessed with and burdened by the need to be in a positive relationship with God, anxious about life with God in the world to come, but also determined to live with God in the world on earth as it is in heaven. People who believed in and trusted in God's sovereign providential presence ordering human affairs, a living God who gently cares for and provides for all God's children and calls us to do the same. I am grateful that today's lectionary reading is from 1 Thessalonians, although I'll admit that I'm using this text to point to something not directly related to the text. And therefore, this is not a very Protestant sermon today. But what I want to do, what I want to do is draw our attention to something that Paul says here and then suggest why this really is a marvelous text for Reformation Sunday. What struck me about Paul's letter to the church, the church here in Thessalonica, is just how personal it is. How much Paul loves the people in this church. How near and dear they are to his heart. He reminds them that his ministry with them was always honest and sincere. As you know, and as God is our witness, he wrote, we never came with words of flattery or with a pretext of greed, nor did we seek praise from mortals, whether from you or others. But we were gentle among you, like a nurse, tenderly caring for her own children. Let this image sink in. We don't often associate this kind of language with Paul. Listen, even feel your way into this text. But we were gentle among you, like a nurse tenderly caring for her children. Why? So deeply do we care for you that we are determined to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves because you have become very dear to us. It's a moving, touching expression of love. Yes, Paul and his team were eager to share the good news of God, proclaim the gospel. 
but they also desired to share their lives, flesh and blood and soul, with these people who had become dear and precious to them. Here, Paul is like a mother, exercising maternal influence over the church. He's like a nurse tenderly caring for the weak and the ill and the vulnerable. Like a mother tenderly caring for her children. So yes, share the gospel, preach the good news, theology matters, belief matters. But don't forget that the Lord shared his life with us and continues to share his life with us. In fact, you can tell when the gospel is enacted and embodied in, in God's people. When in love, we give our lives to another. When we share our very selves. When we share our lives. When we serve and when we give. When we genuinely care for people. You see, the church has always been most faithful and most effective when it seeks to genuinely care for people when it reaches out to the lowest and the least and welcomes them into the fold, when it engages in ministries that seek the health and wholeness, the healing of God's people, when the church provides safety and protection, sanctuary to the vulnerable, to the exile, to the refugee, the one alienated in mind, body, or spirit. We know that the first Christians cared for the sick and cared for the dying. They fed the hungry. They provided protection and safety. Convents and monasteries provided hospitality and shelter and food. This call to alleviate human suffering has been a constant one, a common thread running through the history of the church. In fact, Philip Jenkins, contemporary historian of Christianity, argues that the church has been most successful when it engages in ministries of healing, it's probably the strongest factor pulling or attracting people into the church, into and toward Christianity. And this is especially true today in the two-thirds world. Holistic healing, the healing of the body, the healing of the mind, the healing of the soul, the healing of the spirit, the healing of society. It's a fascinating observation that he makes. There was a time when ministers and priests saw themselves as essentially doctors of the soul. And I wonder if the decline of the church in the West is perhaps somehow related to the fact that the church has set this work of healing, that we have set this, this, this work of healing aside and given it over to science and medicine and healthcare professionals doing a really, really good job. But perhaps we no longer see ourselves as agents of healing. Perhaps the church itself will begin to heal when it reclaims its role as healer. Like a nurse tenderly caring for all of God's children. It's often forgotten that there was a tender, caring side to the Reformation. Consider Geneva, this bastion of the Reformed movement in Switzerland. During the Reformation, it became known as the city of refuge, especially for French Protestants, for Huguenots, forced to flee from persecution. Calvin encouraged those who could not remain in France defending their, their faith in the face of persecution. If they could not stay in France, then he encouraged them to go into exile. And soon thousands began to flee to Geneva and from there into Switzerland and then north into Germany. The outpouring of compassion and support was a testimony to the power of the gospel. And this was especially true in Geneva. Administrative structures were quickly set up to meet the immediate, the immediate needs of the influx of refugees arriving in the city with physical and emotional and spiritual trauma and anguish. 
If you, as a refugee, arrived at the city gates, you were met by the deacons, by the diaconate, and they welcomed you warmly into the city. And then they found a place for you to live. Families opened up their homes to welcome the refugees. The need was so great in Geneva that additional stories were built on top of tenement buildings to accommodate the influx of refugees. And in the old part of Geneva, you can still make out which tenements, which buildings had an additional floor or two added to the very top. The deacons set up an employment service and found work for everyone able to work. Direct financial assistance was given. They organized financial support from individual churches in the city and hosted days of prayer. Geneva and Switzerland as a whole welcomed approximately 60,000 Reformed Protestants from France, and about 20,000 remained in Geneva. Now, there were challenges, of course. You can just imagine how chaotic and, cha and difficult this was. Some were troubled by the added social and financial strain of caring for all of those refugees. But overall, it was a life-giving, transforming experience for Protestant Europe. And it left its mark on the Reformed or Calvinist tradition in Switzerland and Germany and Scotland and later here on these shores. And this legacy, of course, spread down through the centuries throughout the world. It continues to be a generative element of Protestantism. Now, of course, we are certainly not alone in this work. We are partners with many other Christians. We are partners with the Jewish community as well in this work of healing. But it's within our DNA, too, that we need to remember. Tender care, tenderly caring, binding up the wounds of the people. Consider all of the hospitals and clinics we have established and continue to support. Right here in Baltimore, Greater Baltimore Medical Center, GBMC, a wonderful hospital, a huge hospital, one of the best hospitals in the city, grew out of the Presbyterian Eye, Ear, and Throat Charity Hospital, which originally grew out of a clinic that a Civil War surgeon set up in East Baltimore in his carriage house in 1887. Yes, Presbyterians, as part of the Reformed theological tradition, we are a people reformed and always reforming. But maybe we should also think of ourselves as cared for and always caring, or maybe healed and always healing called to a ministry of reforming and caring and healing the broken, the hurting, the disabled, the suffering, the dying. It's a history, I think, we need to reclaim. Over the past couple of years, in some of my own research in the relationship between theology and psychology, as well as my time studying at the Jung Institute in Zurich, I have discovered to my utter amazement that the field of psychology that emerged at the end of the 19th century and early 20th century in Europe, especially in Zurich and in Geneva, that, was, that, that emergence was directly related to Reformed Christians. Many psychologists, such as Theodore Flournoy in Geneva, as well as Jung in Zurich, believed that understanding how and why the psyche suffers and then developing methods of psychotherapy, meaning healing the soul, would be of inestimable value to pastors caring for their parishioners. This connection has largely been forgotten. The practice of pastoral care and counseling emerge out of the desire to tenderly care for the hurting psyche, the human soul. There's a German word that I've come to love over the years. It's Seelsorge. It's sometimes translated as pastoral care, but it really means one who cares for the soul. Tender care. Tender care. This too is a legacy of the Reformed tradition. The work of the church, the work of the church in the world, needed all the more these days, especially on these shores. In this time, 
surrounded by so much pain and suffering, of death and accumulative grief, as the number of COVID cases continues to rise and as we go into the winter months, which will be difficult, it's all the more important for the church to know that we are being called to act and to serve and to support and to provide a ministry of healing. In a time of so much meanness in the public life, of brutality of language, harshness, lies, deception, selfishness, and fear, followers of Christ can offer tenderness. The church can be a tender and vulnerable place, nursing all God's children with love and with grace and with gentleness. So who today is at the gates of the church? Who today is at the gates of our cities and our communities? Who is at the gates of our families, the gates of our hearts needing protection and safety? In this time when everything feels so tender, where are we being summoned to care all the more? In this time of division and brokenness, where is God calling us to bind up the wounds of the people? We were gentle among you, like a nurse tenderly caring for her own children. May it be so. Amen. There are many gifts, but the same spirit who gives them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. All of us are called to serve and share with generosity and joy. Trusting the abundance of our God, we give to God our morning offering. There are ways you can give online through our website. And here I'm talking specifically to CPC members and friends. If you're not really part of the CPC community, please consider giving to a faith community where you live, a neighborhood church that could use your support at this time. In a time of silence now, we invite you to take a moment to offer thanks for God, whose gifts to you this week, time, talent, money, family, friends, and life itself, and ask yourself, where is the Spirit leading me this week to share my gifts through the work of the church and the love of neighbor? Let us pray. Lord, you have blessed the work of our hands, given us resources and talents to share in your service entrusted us with gifts to share for the building up of your kingdom. We rejoice that you enlist us to participate in your providential care for all creation. We celebrate the work of your spirit in us and in our world. And through these gifts, we give to you in faith and hope. Bless and use them in ways that we may never see, but can nonetheless trust. In Christ's name, we pray. Amen.
Let us pray. Almighty God, as the days shorten and the leaves fall from the trees, we turn to you, our unfailing source of light and life. While we wonder what tomorrow will bring, we are certain of your love for us, no matter what challenges we face. We trust your promise to never abandon us and your power to uphold us all our days. We marvel that you choose to be in relationship with us, forgiving us repeatedly and surrounding us with grace daily. Confident in your never-changing character of mercy and kindness, we turn to you now in prayer, laying bare our hopes, our fears, and the longings of our hearts. Alpha and Omega, there is no corner of creation that does not belong to you, that is not beloved by you. We neglect our neighbors and ignore our siblings who cry out for help, but like a loving mother, you cannot forget your children. Bring to our minds those for whom you would have us pray. As we remember the hurting and vulnerable you hold especially close, give us the courage to tend to them in ways that reflect your compassion and justice. Remind us yet again that when one part of the body hurts, we all suffer until that time we all rejoice together. God of all that is seen and unseen, you give us your commandments that we might live in ways that reflect your will and make abundant life for everyone. All of the law and prophets is summed up in loving you with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and our neighbors as ourselves. We ask, therefore, that our love of you and one another be tangible and transformative. Send your spirit to enable us to practice mutual forgiveness, radical hospitality, generous mercy, and relentless kindness. Help us to be gentle with one another, with the earth, and with those desperate for relief and compassion. Loving Lord, we pause to rest in your presence. knowing that we are approved by you to be entrusted with the message of the gospel. We ask to be bold in our witness and humble in our service for the sake of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who taught us to say when we pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
And now receive the charge. As God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bear with one another, and if anyone has a complaint against another, forgive each other just as the Lord has forgiven you. So you also must forgive. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit remain with you today and always. Go in God's peace. Amen.